Good evening to the parents that have already started to join us. Um, we'll give it another few seconds and then we'll start off with the program. We are recording this session. We will be sharing a link on uh, YouTube and Facebook for you to view should you for some reason log out. Um, just to quickly, my name is Anne Louise. I'm your host this evening, just to give you a couple of house rules for those parents that have started to join us. We do have a QA and a and chat box, uh, which we ask you to actively participate and ask your questions so that we can keep it informative. So this evening we'll have uh, Cambridge and IEB on display that is offered at Eagle House School. So just before we start off, um, we, I'm going to introduce you to the IEB principal, Mark Ruza, who will start with his introduction. Thank you. Good evening, parents and learners, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Anne Louise. Um, Welcome to our beautiful school. Uh, I think the video, if you've missed the introduction or the introductory video, uh, the school speaks for itself. So I wonder if uh, I can maybe just share my screen. You should be able to. Okay. Right, can you see my screen? It's busy loading, yes, perfect. Okay, so, uh, you know, like I said, uh, thank you to our beautiful school. And I know that you, in the process, maybe are looking uh, at various schools with probably many questions. And I think the question is always why Eagle House? So I'll be talking about the IEB section and Ma'am Linda will talk about the Cambridge section. Uh, but together we form one unit and we try to offer the best uh, that we can possibly offer. And I think our track record from the IEB section speaks for itself with uh, 100% pass rate. And we've also been a top independent school since we started basically, uh, but it's been noted since we started our matric group. And for the past 13 years, we've been a top performing independent school in our district. And what normally helps this is the small classes that we have and also our versatile teachers. You know, it's uh, the, the teachers understand exactly what it is that we are busy with. And uh, our teachers are stable, they're passionate and they know the children. So I promised not to talk too much or say, or be too long, but just shortly about uh, what IB is. We follow the normal CAPS curriculum, uh, which means it's the, the normal curriculum offered by the Department of Education. So it's a normal CAPS. Uh, but it's it's uh, through the IEB, okay, and it's been monitored by the IEB, and it's underwritten and monitored by Umalusi as well. So we are fully accredited to to offer the IEB, and we offer most of the subjects that they do offer. And I think within the Alma group, we still babies, and within a couple of years, we will be offering more of the subjects that are currently on offer. So we do offer 12 of the most common subjects that uh, is being offered. And also the learners will probably be covered in all aspects or all spheres that they would like to enter into. Uh, I think where you find yourself now is what decision do you make? Okay, what I can tell you is that our school is not a school that's regarded as a one size fits all. You know, our school is, is unique, it's different because we focus on the individual child. Uh, I know you've heard this many times, but I think our track record speaks and that is what helped us get uh, the results that we have and the relationship that we have with the children as well as with the department. So every single child is unique. And what we do implement is uh, the high impact teaching strategies. And this is what helps us uh, throughout the teaching. 
And if there is a school that does not offer high impact teaching, you know, then we should be wary about it because this is basically what drives uh, the education. So every single one of them have specific functions, you know, and combined we look at uh, differentiated teaching. And that is one of the aspects that sets us apart from the rest. You know, we try to use the, the cognitive feedback uh, because not all children learn the same way, but it's important that they know what they are learning and how they learn. And that really helps us get through. So one of our specialities is small schools. Uh, and, and that is what they set us apart. And when we say uh, many other schools, you know, they compete, but schools can't really compete with us because we offer what they can't. And we're proud of our small school uh, concept. That way we don't lose learners. Uh, and researchers have shown that, you know, one in every five children may have some kind of challenge. And those are the children that normally fall by the wayside. They are lost. And in a small class, there's no way they're going to get lost. And we do make use of all the affordances that we can. You know, that's from technology uh, up until concessions. We, we assist the learners as best as we can with concessions and with all other affordances. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that, you know, we have huge interventions for the learners. And I think that has also been part of it. Uh, it's a small group, so one in 15, there's no way they're going to get away uh, without being noticed in a class. I think you're very familiar with this. Uh, if you look at when school started and where we are currently, not much difference, except maybe for the demographics and the class sizes. And that's what we try to stay away from because uh, there are many schools, you know, we try to offer the learners a different learning experience. So we implementing this kind of setup in our teaching environment. So we do follow a hybrid teaching method where learners are at home. We do have online learners and we don't just have avatars. If you see the screen on the, on the side, we want to see the learners in their faces. So if learners are not feeling well, they could stay home and join online. All our lessons are recorded. So if there's anything they can uh, uh, access the, the, the recorded lesson later on. Okay, but this is what we are striving for. Currently, two of our classrooms are kitted out uh, in this way, and all the other classes only have the whiteboards uh, and most of the technology. But I think this is the ideal classroom. So two of our classrooms uh, are ready for this, which we use quite extensively. But I don't want to say too much because I think the teachers will be taking us through that. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I'll hand over to Mandy. Thank you, Mandy. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, parents. Welcome to our online open day. Very unique concept. Um, but I think it's becoming more and more a feature for today. I'm going to be speaking about languages offered through the IEB. As we're all aware, there are many languages that the IEB can examine. However, at Eagle House at the moment, we are offering um, three, English, Afrikaans, and Zulu. To, you have to um, obviously um, qualify to, to accept or be accepted into those languages. And we're looking at the offerings of French and any other languages like Mandarin, et cetera. How does language work in a big school like this? It's the same like any other school. However, I think it's easier to pick up on difficulties, should that be the case. Um, we teach both hybridly, which means in class, practically in face to face learners, as well as the learners online. And it is very interesting. The children find it. Um, interesting they work well in that environment they cope better I think then um, for me as an adult it's taken me some time to get used to the online aspect but I think I'm getting used to it now and um, it is very um, IB should I say is very demanding when it comes to languages I suppose because it's about uh, assessing the critical thinking skills 
And I think learners love that challenge. They have really um, excelled in getting there and achieving those great results in the languages. And I look forward to meeting your children in class. Thank you so much, Mark and Mandy, for that presentation. Um, we're now going to ho go over to Dennis um, at the Science and Mathematics. Thank you. While Dennis is coming online, I just want to encourage our parents that have uh, now recently joined to please do ask your questions in the Q&A or chat as we move through the program. We will be recording the session. I know that load shedding is um, happening in the area, so we will share that link with you. So let me go to page two. Okay, I can hear you. Let's start the video. Thank you. Sydney and Dennis, thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Dennis. Um, I will share with you what we do in the science department. It's actually the science and maths department. So I've got my colleague here, Sydney, who is going to actually share with you uh, after I've uh, shared the science part. So in the science department, we do have um, uh, physical sciences. We also have life sciences. And since it is science and maths, we also have the maths, the maths pure or maths core. And then we have got the mathematical literacy. So those are basically the four subjects that constitute the science and maths department. Uh, that's for grade 10 to grade 12. And then we do have for grade eight and grade nine, we do have natural sciences. And at, the, at that level, we do have um, mathematics being like a generic mathematics. There's no discretion to say it's gonna be maths lead or maths, maths core, it's generic. Preparing learners for choices at grade 10, where they then choose to do maths core or they go for the mathematical literacy option. Now in the science department, we, we do have facilities that actually promote the learning of science. Science is basically in the business of explaining observations. And when we explain observations, uh, we're looking at what is around us and how do we come up with explanations for that. So after making observations, we then investigate. In our investigations, that's when we end up maybe having to do some experiments. Or if, if there are not experiments that are actually lab best, we're actually going to be doing what are called field excursions, or we go outside, we learn from the environment, collect as much data as possible. And then from that, we come up with patterns. Those patterns then become the science that we then uh, marry or relate with the established body of science, which we call the physical sciences or the life sciences. The physical sciences is where you've got the, the physics and the chemistry. The life sciences is what was traditionally called uh, biological sciences or biology. So that's what we will be doing when we are teaching uh, life sciences and what we will be doing when we are teaching uh, physical sciences. And what you see here is uh, some of the work that the learners will actually be doing. So this was an experiment in physical sciences where they were actually decomposing a chemical, which is a process that is actually uh, mimicking or giving us a picture of what happens when they're actually purifying some materials, when they're actually preparing copper. In this experiment, we're actually extracting copper from a compound. So this is an electrolysis experiment where electricity is used to, to get copper from uh, copper chloride. This is actually related to what happens at large scale in the mining industry when they're actually extracting copper. It's just one of the many activities that we do. Then coming to us embracing the technology, we do have um, uh, devices that we use. Uh, the laboratory is kitted with uh, a, a screen, a monitor, and we do have a camera that allows us to actually track everything that we'll be doing in the class for sharing with those who may not have made it to be in class on a particular day. 
So the activities that will be happening in class can then actually be also ex experienced by any child who they have actually been absent due to medical reasons or some other challenges. They, there's a lot. There's a lot. We, we do practicals as part of examinations for life sciences. We do practicals as part of examinations for physical sciences. And we have been meeting the requirements ever since we started uh, as a school. So we are here to serve and provide services should you uh, enroll your child with us. And you are welcome uh, as I hand over to Sydney to share with you the mathematics part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dennis. Uh, let me just move my file just a little bit up. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to share with you, uh, to just give you a short picture of what happens inside the classroom. I will reiterate, uh, we celebrate individuality of our learners. Uh, we are not a one size fits all uh, school. So when your kids come to us, they come as individuals. Our job is to make sure that we celebrate that individuality. We make them better individuals. We don't try to standardize our children. So here is a quick example of what happens in class. The sum is one. 18 multiplied by 5. But when you look at it, learners will look at 18 by 5 in totally different ways. So mathematics, a, when you ask people about maths outside of um, the, the education system, they think maths is about using methods and methods are constant. But with us, maths is not about using methods or restricting learners to one method. Uh, it's about making connections, it's about reasoning, it's about thinking. That's what we call mathematics. And I'm sitting next to Mr. Dennis because mathematics and science are married. They are intertwined. Deep down, they are one thing. They feed into each other. So the first learner will see 18 is 9 plus 9. So that learner is not multiplying 18 by 5. That learner is multiplying 9 plus 9 by 5. The second learner we we'll see 18 and five as nine and 10. The third learner will see 18 as 10 plus eight multiplied by five. So that's what we celebrate, that individuality. That's what we celebrate. There is a common misconception out there that um, kids who are slow in class, are slow learners, they are labeled, but um, we are researchers, we are enthusiastic. I can tell you that from research, we have realized that those learners who take time to take in things are the ones who end up as more brilliant, who end up performing better. So when your kids enroll with us, what we do is to make them better and stronger individuals. We also um, focus more on the 21st century uh, skills. Uh, those are skills that are transferable. It means when a child goes out of our school, in the world outside of school, they can continue to use those skills. Skills like communication. So we present a lot school skills like uh, cooperative learning or collaboration. Our kids do a lot of group work, but our group works are structured. There is always a purpose behind any activity that we do. I am going to try and just run one file. Uh, I hope it's going to run because it's, it uses a totally different kind of program. Uh, so this is a uh, work from one of our learners where they get to apply a mathematics and science. So let me just see if it's going to run. So from our side, it is running. I'm not sure if you guys are seeing what we are seeing from our side. Perfectly clear. Oh, thank you. Uh, just be patient. <laughs> right, so to an untrained eye, this might look as if uh, the learner is drawing and painting, but this was a lesson on Cartesian plane and angles. So to create something like this, the learner has gone through lines and lines of coding, and those lines are actually very complex, complex to a point where 
if you are a parent and you see your child doing stuff like this, you'll be afraid of your own child. So you may not see, but whatever you saw there started from here and this child went through all this. You can see there are a lot of coordinates and those coordinates are not just coordinates, they are all connected. They all led to what you saw about sailing in water. So this is our, our emphasis, 21st century skills, use of technology and application of skills. Those skills that we give them in class, we want them to use uh, those skills outside of the class. And uh, just to emphasize, uh, we use um, explicit teaching. So at the beginning of any unit, we, the teacher explains clearly to learners why they are learning a certain topic. There's so many times where kids get frustrated because they don't actually understand why they are learning what they are learning. So number one will be the careers uh, around that topic. And number two will be for lower grades, they are topics that are tested in the exit uh, grade, in grade 12, where learners uh, graduate with a certificate that is needed at university. So we explain to them that the focus is not on grades, but the focus is on a understanding for future sake, either for exams in grade 12 or for careers beyond, uh, beyond uh, high school or for general knowledge. If it's for general knowledge, that's it. And if it's for cross-cutting concepts that are needed in other subjects, we explain that right at the beginning. But from then on, once the kids start doing activities, you will start to see how different the kids are. And then the teacher has to make sure that the focus goes to one child and then the next and then the next instead of focusing on the group as a whole, which is what we are trying to run away from. So yes, our classes are very uh, small for, so that we can meet that purpose of, um, or that task of differentiating. I am not going to say much, um, we are doers, we don't preach that much. Uh, so I will leave it here. Ango Dennis, back to you. Uh, uh, thank you. I do not have much. Uh, we are uh, waiting for any questions. Perfect. After perfect. I, I, perfect. Thank you, thank you so much for that. I think it's a nice thank display in terms of technology integration with the mathematics. I just wanted to quickly, a uh, parent has asked, what is mathematics score and the difference? Just okay. a brief explanation, then we'll Thank move you. on. Thank you. So, so math core is what we, what is generally known out there as mathematics. So that is pure mathematics. Then there is mathematical literacy, which is mathematics about real world stuff. So kids who do not do mathematical uh, mathematics, they have to do. It's a must. You either have. You either do mathematical literacy or you do pure maths. So mathematical literacy in general, it's real world mathematics. And then the abstract one, uh, which uh, is not really abstract deep down is pure maths. So what parents traditionally know as mathematics is math core. Uh, mathematical literacy was introduced recently for kids who struggle with pure mathematics, but nonetheless, it's not less important than a uh, math call. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dennis and Sydney. We, we appreciate that. Uh, we will also discuss the differences on the Cambridge because there is quite a big difference uh, between IAB and the Cambridge terminologies. I'm going to quickly move on to Freeman for technology and commerce. Thank you so much, Dennis Thank and you. Sydney. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne Louise. Um, Thank you and welcome parents. Thank you for joining this virtual call. I'm going to be focusing more on the subject of the commerce side. And if you just allow me to quickly share, um, I'm focusing on the commerce subject. And um, for IEB starting from grade eight, going up to grade 12, at grade eight and nine, uh, our commerce is um, referred to or given the name EMS, but EMS is actually three subjects that is accounting, business studies and economics. And then as you proceed from grade 10 going to grade 12, this subject actually becomes standalone subjects. 
So then we have accounting as a standalone subject, business studies, and then economics. Uh, in terms of our, our focus with, with business studies, it is about real business simulation projects. We try and recreate the business world in classroom. One of the main projects that we, as much as possible, run every year is the market day or the entrepreneur's day, wherein our focus is to say, Mr. Dennis is teaching you how to create products. Uh, in business studies, accounting and economics, we are trying to say, how do we monetize this product that we have created? How do we make sure that this product gets to the customer? And how do we know through learning in business studies and economics, how do we do market research and therefore determine what does the actual society needs? What problems can we solve? And then if we go back to the science lab, they then go and devise ways and of creating solutions for the problems. But in business studies, we are saying, here is a problem that can be monetized and I think the focus for students, they get very excited when we start talking about, we are not just learning a subject for the sake of it. Business studies, accounting, economics are indeed practical subjects because if you see business managers, they are doing this business studies in practice. So what we focus on is to actually teach students, how do you go about registering a company? How do you go about submitting a tax return? And, and the focus there is, we go back to one of the questions uh, that, that are always being asked in society, which is why did they not teach us the actual things that we were supposed to learn? So for example, many people are frustrated with the education system because they were not taught The curriculum, they actually go through and teach students, this is how you go on SARS website. So instead of us focusing on the theoretical bit of you submit text to SARS, if you are employed, you pay pay as you earn. If you are a business, you can register for VAT and you pay corporation tax. We actually simulate and go on SARS website and say, this is where you would go if you want to register. So our focus in business studies, accounting and economics is to try and connect the dots between the theoretical subject and simulate it into real world so that students can actually see. We also show them how to use accounting software because many students are now learning that in most cases, even the people at work, they are no longer doing accounting the way that it was done before. Now there's accounting software. So it doesn't matter how much accounting you know, you now need to understand accounting software. And we are bringing this back into class and say, before you finish grade 12, you actually understand accounting software. You can do bookkeeping for if you have a business at home, you can actually do it on an accounting software, which is a skill that in most cases has been neglected. People have been learning, memorizing how to do these things, but without actually going to do it practical. One of the challenges that we have also taken upon ourselves for 2022 is as, as a department is to join the Johannesburg Stock Exchange Investment Challenge. With the Johannesburg Stock Exchange Investment Challenge, what happens is students who are doing the commerce uh, stream of subjects, they participate in a virtual investment, but it's actually real world. The only difference is they are not making real money, but they're actually investing on the stock exchange. They go through the fundamental analysis just like an, an adult, stock investor would do, they go through the technical analysis and then decide that we are going to buy an empty and share. And then over the course of the year, we then see how much they're actually going to make from their stock exchange investment. And then they are, they are given virtual coins to use for this investment by the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. What this does to students is it brings this abstract idea of there is an institution called Johannesburg Stock Exchange. The abstract idea of there is investments that happen somewhere because the problem in class, there's a tendency to think that there is a select few people who are supposed to invest on the stock market. For us, we are just supposed to learn it in the textbook. And we are trying to run away from that and say, 
this is actually what is happening in the real world. You actually go and you log in, you buy shares, you then sell these shares when you think that the fundamentals are indicating as such. So, so our focus by and large is to try and say the business theory that we are learning, but then how do we apply it? How do we ensure that the products that have been made are get to the customer and how do we ensure that we derive economic value from that i think in short that's what we do in business studies our sincerest hope is to be able to meet your child and try and impact on them in one way or the other thank you so much back to you and louis perfect thank you very much freeman for that and uh, then we're going to move over to the cambridge section of uh, eagle house uh, linda salia or principal at the cambridge side if you can uh, please introduce yourself and start your introduction thank you and louise yes what a privilege to be surrounded by such wonderful people and uh, there's another team coming up so um, yes, welcome everybody, and we hope to see many of you in the future, bringing your kids to this fantastic school. So Mark has explained the Eagle House IEB site, and we are the Eagle House Cambridge site. And um, so that's the school we are running here. We offer grade eight, and then grade nine and 10 forms the IGCSE curriculum. And at the end of grade 10, students are writing an international Cambridge exam. Um, our exam center is um, with Alma Mater High School. So we're using exactly the same textbooks, same curriculum, and that's where they write their exams. So after grade 10, and uh, just you, so you know, the IGCSE stands for the International General Certificate of Standard Education. And after grade 10, which is often the certificate that students may apply to universities, but Anne-Louise knows more about that than I do, um, to get a conditional approval or acceptance if they are doing AS level the next year, which is on the trip. Uh, we offer AS level over one year or two, year, two years, or you can write, do one year the curriculum and then write the next year in May, June. Um, we do have students that are running that over two years, they grade 11 and 12, no problem with that. After AS level, they can also carry on doing their A levels. Generally, they would do two or three A level subjects. And I wasn't going to share anything, but I thought maybe I must just try and share this a little bit. Um, okay, Arnold, no, I think I just want to get a, a little bit of knowledge about the Cambridge section. Um, if you look at the left hand side on the screen there, there are four options. Because we are Cambridge, meaning an international qualification of matric level and higher than matric if you carry on with A levels, these are the options or the combinations that a student needs to receive a matric with exemption certificate from USAP, our Universities of South Africa, who has set this criteria together to comply with our local universities' requirements. So when you're going on to AS level, you can use four AS level subjects with A to D symbols, plus your one IGCSE, that is your grade 10 subject, uh, as a fifth subject with A, B or C symbols, and that combination will give you a matric with exemption certificate. The same with this one, five AS level subjects, passing with ABCD will give you that certificate. And the other two are linked to A level. So if a student carries on with two A level subjects, passing with the A2E plus three, grade 10 or IGCSE at an A, B or C symbol, they will also obtain a matric with exemption certificate and three A levels with one IGC certificate. Um, okay, so I hope there's no more questions on that one. Then, um, so that is the curriculum we offer. Generally, Cambridge drills down deep into most of their topics. Um, we focus on a lot of skills and definitely application. So that is what makes this curriculum very after. A lot of companies, a lot of universities worldwide 
are very pro-Cambridge, especially if our students want to go study overseas, they will probably require A-level subjects with good symbols. Um, yes, we run our curriculum and our subjects according to a structured timetable. All lessons are recorded. There are students online or students come physically to our classes here on this beautiful campus, which I think is not all conducive to learning. The calmness um, and the nature on this campus is really very beautiful. Um, we also have assessment schedule, so a student knows up front for the term uh, which test they will be writing when. And according to that, it just makes life easier for teachers and for students. Our classes are very small. And it varies from one to two students um, in A-levels especially, to maximum between 12 and 17, generally English, maths, which are the subjects that all students um, must take. We have a subject choice form, which parents and students complete when they start here. We give them access after the um, admissions process to Teams, and all classes um, are happening on Teams, as I said, being recorded. And Mark has indicated the technology and the facilities that we do have here. So yeah, uh, there's absolutely no excuse for a student to fall behind. Uh, they get their homework on Teams, they can communicate with their teachers on Teams, um, and they can go back and listen to their recorded lessons. So I think I'm just gonna stop there for now, and Louise, and then maybe we can continue with our teachers to share some of the subject information with us. Perfect. I think um, if I can pause just for one minute in terms of what devices a student would need for the Cambridge site specifically, and then we'll go back to the IEB. Thank you. Um, okay, generally our students, you know what, technology is so advanced. We had students writing the exams from their phones, but yes, that's not ideal. We would prefer that students will have a, a laptop especially from an ICT or a computer science view, um, definitely to be online and to <coughs> upload homework. Even if they write assessments online, they can just write it, scan it and upload the assessments. It helps us with the record keeping as well. So I think uh, Mama Dell from the high school, our IT teacher will assist us with the specs uh, regarding on laptops and we will communicate that to all parents. I believe that's normally communicated and we'll have our admissions officer on right at the end um, on the stationary pack, what would be required or what is recommended. Um, I'm going to ask some lovely questions, but I will ask them towards the end at the general Q&A unless they are subject related. So please do keep um, asking those lovely questions as we run through the program. <coughs> Next up, we've got Arnold. I'm just going to share here with Arnold. Hello, Arnold. There we go. Good evening, colleagues and parents. Welcome to Alma Mater, Cambridge. Uh, I'm going to discuss on physics, what we, what we cover here in physics, and I'm just waiting for my screen to start sharing. It's going to take a while. Oh, no, this one is not the one that is sharing. Mm -hmm. It's already up, thank you. Okay, thank you. So I found it fit to start with a quote from Sir Albert Einstein, and here goes our quote. In the Department of Physics, we desire to understand the universe and how it is made up, and we try to share, we share this desire with our students who are inquisitive, our students who are curious to understand the underlying the makeup of the universe, uh, how we got to be where we are. Are we created by chance or are we are a creation that comes from a grand plan and all those questions. So we allow our students to be very open-minded as they approach the, our subject and we encourage them and we try to guide them as much as we can. Our approach in Cambridge Physics encourages our students to have some properties like being confident, being responsible, reflective, and they are always, always expected to be innovative. If they cannot be innovative on their own, we bring in activities that improve that aspect of their, of their life. 
some of the subjects, just a few of the subjects that we, of the topics that we cover in our syllabus. Uh, this includes from grade nine up to A level. We will be increasing in depth as we move from one level to the top level. So these are the topics that we, we share with our students and we teach here. These are some of the career paths that are available to our students if they choose to major in physics. And this is just a drop in the ocean of the possible careers that they can, they can follow. So they are spoiled for choice when it comes to what they can do if they pass or if they choose to pursue physics. We are very practical. We are very hands-on as has been uh, alluded by the guys who do IEB. Uh, this term, we are working on a project on how to make a periscope. And on top of just making that periscope, the student will understand the principles behind the operation of a periscope and how science improves the, 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 the lives of everyday people. So this is a diagram that can be given to students and they will find a way of getting to the product which is shown in the diagram. Uh, on the other side of my slide, I have a real life example of where a periscope may be, may be used. And just in case that a submarine that is trying to peep whilst the rest of the body is in water. So this is a very, very helpful project and the students can actually see how technology or how science can transfer into, into technology in the real world. So to wrap this up, I'm going to just share the one of the experiments which we conduct here it's one of many many experiments that we conduct and this is investigation of kickoff first law and i'm sorry i'm going to take you through a little bit of numbers here so what kickoff's law says is when current enters a junction which has been labeled b here when current enters a junction which has been labeled b here all that current must be found to exit that junction. So if 10 amps enters the junction, 10 amps should leave that junction. And we are going to demonstrate that experiment using just a few of the equipment that we have in our very well equipped laboratory. So I'm going to ask Mem Linda to switch the screen so that we can go to the setup of the experiment. <laughs> Can they hear me from here? Okay, can you get it on the big screen or not? Okay, yeah, I can see. Okay, can you hear me clearly over there? Perfect. I've just switched the screen to just the camera. Okay, perfect. All right, so from the second that you just saw on my slide sheet, our students will learn to build using that second, those second symbols which were on the, on the diagram. And here is an example of the law that I just talked about. We have our current that is going to enter into this junction over there. And we want to prove that the same current will be, will be coming out of the junction. I've just included the lights for vividness, but they were not very necessary. So we will switch on our switch here. And this, can you see the reading there, Mr. Lawrence? 0 0.63 amps. Yes. Okay, so 0 0.63 amps is the current which is entering our junction and we should find that 0 0.63 getting out of the junction. So the current is going to get out of the junction using two parts. And one of our ammeters here is showing 0 0.30. That 0 0.30 has chosen this part. And the other ammeter here is showing 0 0.31 and it's fluctuating. That is because every time we do experiments, there is room for environmental conditions that will bring some error and we, we correct that error in our calculations. So this is one of the experiments that your students or your children will be ex exposed to. And in real life, they can see 
how the science which is in the books can translate to the science which is in the which is in real life. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much um, for that demonstration and the introduction there. And then we're going to go over to Daniel. Hi. Um, thanks, Arnold. That was really cool to watch. Um, hi, I'm Danielle. I am the biology teacher on the Cambridge side. I teach biology to grade nines, tens, AS and A level kids, and I teach coordinated science to the grade eights. So coordinated science is the equivalent of natural science over on the IUB side. It's just a combination of chemistry, physics, and biology. Um, but I think biology is where my true passion lies. Um, I think a lot of the, the teachers have spoken about what we as a school can offer, um, which is great. I think we have great facilities and, and we have great engagement with the children. But I wanted to talk specifically about biology um, and how it's a benefit to your children as a subject choice and specifically Cambridge biology, why um, it's a good choice to me. So biology is basically understanding the living world around us from a scientific point of view. Um, the oldest biologists started off um, just seeing things and noticing things and then went to go and understand why those things happen, just like any other science. Um, particularly with the Cambridge biology curriculum, a huge variety of topics are covered. So anywhere from ecology to plant science, Human sciences, genetics, they're all covered in the Cambridge curriculum. It is a truly in-depth um, curriculum that really gets to the heart of every topic. Um, and I think it really opens up the students to figure out what it is that they enjoy. Um, because when they find particular topics that they enjoy, they can further study those further and decide if those are things that they wanna make careers out of. But I think biology especially is important because it's relatable to everyday life. Um, I think in more of a physical, tangible sense than the other sciences are in that if I study plants, I can go outside and look at a plant and see what I'm studying and interact with it. And I think biology is very important for those reasons. Um, a lot of people think that when we go into biology, our only career options are medicine or laboratory research. I think that's where everyone's mind goes. Um, but biology is an incredibly diverse topic or, or subject, and it can be paired with almost anything. Um, so we have great things like wildlife management, um, but we also, a new burgeoning field is bioinformatics. So it's a great pair between biology and computer sciences. So all your um, kids who are wanting to learn IT and coding and things along those lines, those are very well paired with biology, um, especially seeing how biology is moving forward in this age of technology. Um, for those more on the artistic side, um, scientific illustration and scientific writing are big career fields um, and they're often overlooked. Cambridge biology in particular is, um, I think, a very good choice because there's a full and in-depth coverage of not only fundamental biological concepts, but the way that these are applied um, currently in current science. Um, and their curriculum is constantly being updated. So when there are new um, breakthroughs in certain topics, those are covered in the curriculum. But the curriculums, because they're international, um, they're international certificates, they're also um, specified to South Africa. So a lot of our biological concepts that we cover deal with, um, for example, ecology within a South African context. So if we're discussing wildlife management, we're discussing how um, the effect of rhinos going extinct might affect the South African economy. And I think um, that's also very important. But also, like Arnold showed you before, there's a complete integration with biology um, and all the sciences and their practical components. So every topic that we cover also has a practical component that reinforces those theoretical concepts. Um, I think biology is, of course, a great pick. 
Cambridge biology even more so. And I think that our school in particular um, really pushes home the fact that, you know, it's not just a pie in the sky idea that you're studying. These are real life things that we can look at and we can see and we can learn the physical aspects of them um, through practicals. But also we encourage our students to be inquisitive in the sense that this is maybe an abstract concept to you, but if you take that abstract context, uh, concept and put it in the context of any sort of real life situation, that will help you um, understand it better. So yeah, that's all I have for you today. Perfect. Thank you very much, Daniel. That's, that's a lovely presentation on biology and the many applications. Um, we're going to go over to Lawrence and get him on board. And then we've got two more speakers or panelists, and then we'll have our general Q&A for all these lovely questions. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Good evening, uh, parents and teachers. All right, my name is Lawrence. I'm taking business studies and economics, uh, Cambridge. Uh, sorry for that. Okay, I'm taking business studies and economics, Cambridge from uh, grade A to to A level. All right, uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. We can right, see there screen. is Thank that's you. business studies. You can see that those are serious people, uh, business people, and then we come to economics. So I'm going to say something in brief about e uh, economics. So we 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 cannot talk of uh, uh, politics, or we cannot divorce politics from economics. Right. Whenever we talk about uh, politics, let's say even the invasion of uh, Ukraine the war in Ukraine, we are basically talking about economics, seeing how it has affected uh, the world in terms of uh, the, the, the prices, all right? So uh, if we are uh, going to the polls, voting ANC, EFF, DA, we are also deciding our economic uh, fate, right? So economics uh, in Cambridge, this is the outline of the syllabus. Uh, it covers a range of basic economic ideas including the introduction <clears throat> of the price system. Right, what do you mean by the price system? Right, each and every time we see prices going up, is it because pick and pay or shop right, they've just uh, decided to say, okay, tomorrow you want bread to be at 24 rand. What happens is the ecosystem of many variables. Right, we also, uh, on the macroeconomic level, we speak of international trade, uh, the exchange rate, I call it uh, the dollar price of a rand, right? And then also the measurement of employment, inflation, and the causes and consequences of inflation. So let us also study the price system, the theory of the firm, market failure, macroeconomic theory and policy, economic growth, as well as development. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, um, okay, economics is divided into two. There is what we call microeconomics and macroeconomics, right? Microeconomics is the study of individual markets, right? Like now in part, we study the market for ice cream and the market for coffee or tea. Obviously the demand for tea cannot rise at this moment in time, all right, because it's hot. Then we move on to macroeconomics. It is the start of the entire economy as a whole. Examples include uh, studying the total size of the economy or the unemployment rate, among other things. Right, we're gonna look at um, what you call macroeconomic problems. Right, we have uh, 
aspects like economic growth, unemployment. In South Africa, we have a very high level of unemployment. All right. And then we also have inflation. We see prices going up. I'm going to briefly explain uh, the mechanism of inflation. We also have the balance of payments as well as the exchange rates. All right, so I'm going to briefly uh, speak about inflation. You can see what's happening there. All right, the definition of inflation is a sustained increase in the economic uh, general price level. You see what's happening there, um, housing, car insurance, and all those things, right? They are heavier than uh, our rent or dollar in this uh, context, all right? And then you see what's happening there, that a big red is uh, uh, just uh, consuming your real income while you're watching, there is nothing you can do, all right? Those chaps are just looking. All right, so now I'm going to look at, uh, briefly look at the causes of inflation. Is it that people just wake up or the government say, okay, our inflation rate is 8%. What happens, right? So we have two causes of inflation. The first one is called post-push inflation, right? Rising oil prices. Right, uh, rising nominal wages. When we see these trade unions demonstrating, right, for uh, the increment in wages, what are they doing? They are also contributing towards um, uh, inflation, right? We also have higher direct taxes that is value added tax, rising food um, and energy prices, and also devaluation of our rent. So if our rent goes low in value, what happens, right? Our companies that are importing raw materials are going to find it costly to import th those raw materials. And uh, the eventuality of that is that they are going to transfer uh, those costs to uh, the uh, prices of their final products. Then we end up having cost push inflation. Right, then the last cause, we call it demand pull inflation. Right, you can see what's happening there. Um, demand pull inflation is it because um, uh, there's uh, too much money in the economy? That is the money uh, supply expansion, right? So basically, here when we talk of uh, demand pull inflation, it's whereby people are buying too much, right? So by buying too much, they are putting an upward pressure on the prices. So is it because of uh, the increase in money supply or is it because of consumer expectations, right? If consumers are confident, if they are confident, they won't be saving, right? They will be buying a lot and that puts an upward pressure on the prices, right? Is it because of fiscal or government stimulus whereby uh, the government injects a lot of money into the economy that puts an upward pressure on the prices, right? Is it because of the growing economy, right? If the economy is growing, a lot of people get employed, they get money and they buy too much, they go on holidays, that puts an upward pressure on the prices, right? Is it because of uh, what you call credit boom? Let's say the interest rate has gone down. People find it cheaper to go to FNB, to go to NetBank, to borrow money, to spend. That's a credit boom. All right, so um, whether it be uh, the uh, cost push inflation or demand pull inflation, it needs to be corrected, right? It's a, a macroeconomic problem. It needs to be corrected. Before I jump over to correction, or uh, how do we solve in, uh, the problem of inflation, right? This presentation would be, wouldn't be enough if we do not do a little bit of a graphical presentation. Those who hate economics because of these graphs, those who love economics is also because of these graphs, All right? So what's happening there is uh, the interaction of supply and demand. I always ask my learners to say, okay, 
consumers want low prices and then suppliers want higher prices. So who wins eventually? There's no one who's gonna win. It's an agreement. That agreement, we call it equilibrium in economics, right? So like here, uh, this is our first equilibrium where supply and demand meet. So if it happens that there is too much demand in the economy due to the reasons that we've already given, that puts in upward pressure on the prices and our inflation um, rate jumps from P1 to P2, that is a higher price level. All right, so we can also, see, uh, we can clearly see that this is a problem. Inflation is a problem. So now, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with inflation? Do we uh, go into the streets demonstrating burning tires? What do we do? Right, the government formulates policies to deal with inflation. We have what we call fiscal policy. Uh, um, that's uh, when the government uh, uses an instrument called taxation, taxes, right? If they realize that there is cost push inflation, right? That means businesses are paying higher corporation tax. So it reduces the tax so that it becomes cheaper and easier for the business world to produce. Or is it demand pull inflation? They increase taxes so that they hit people's pockets and then uh, they reduce demand. We also have government spending and then uh, another policy, we call it monetary policy. That is the control of the uh, money that is circulating in the economy, money supply, right? Interest rate. Uh, recently, the interest rate was uh, uh, increased. So what is the effect? What are the effects of the increase in interest rate? So if we are having demand pool inflation, right? The increase in interest rate, remember interest rate is the cost of borrowing, is to, to hit people. They won't go to f and to borrow, to spend. And that helps in solving the problem of inflation, all right? And uh, finally, we also have what goes supply side policies, whereby uh, the government boosts uh, productive potential of the economy, right? When there is a, a, an increase in production, that's, that, uh, that is going to put a downward pressure on the prices to solve uh, this problem. All right, so that's all from my side. Perfect, Lawrence. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just being a little sensitive towards our family's times. Thank you for your presentation. We're going to quickly move on to Tambi. I know um, there was some technical issues. If she's not able to come on, we'll go on to Adam. And uh, let's try and keep that short so that we can get around to all these questions. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, parents. Uh, good evening, teachers from uh, Eagle House. Uh, I'm just going to be brief and I'll try to, I teach chemistry uh, and you will notice that in some cases, like the case of IEB, they join the two subjects, physics and chemistry into what are called the physical sciences. And they are physical sciences because it's tangible things that we deal with almost in real life. And uh, something that we have, actually uh, developed is that uh, in our lessons, and this is especially in the chemistry and the physics, because it's a physical uh, science, there is a homework that we give to say, uh, we are talking about pollution and we are trying to get the students to be up on board and to understand how it impacts their daily life. So we give an assignment like go with your parents when you fill up uh, petrol at the station, please take note of what's written there. It says there is this much sulfur past the million. Go find out how much in the 93 uh, metal free, what is this metal that we are talking about? And we find out that it's lead. And then we now start talking about what does it uh, affect? So in the real life, now they know why is the exhaust pipe under the car having some other thing instead of just giving the gases out? There is a catalytic converter that's in there. And we also try to check, go and ask your parents, 
Do we know what this is about? We're not trying to give the parents a test. We are just saying uh, in real life, these things that we are learning in class are actually applicable to the daily lives and we could actually help uh, with the environment. We could actually help with saving. I usually refer to chemistry as the economics of science. That's where we work. But to the environment as a whole might be actually bigger than what we think. We have had answers like we say, how do we save our environment? Then students say, let's use the electric car. We get down to how are we making our electricity? We find out that 80% of our electricity is from a thermal power station. Doesn't really help to use more electricity. We would need to use different uh, ways of actually saving. So all that, because these are physical sciences, everything must relate to daily life. If it doesn't, I always insist in my classes for chem that if it doesn't impact real life, then we might as well not do it at all. Because even the examination will emphasize more on uh, questions like how you would reduce, for example, pollution. And that would mean you have to think about real life and revert back to all this to real life to then be able to formulate an answer that's a suggestion. So it's not just about memorizing and remembering, but it's also about actually being able to get a wholesome student that will come out uh, with a, a pass in terms of the curriculum, but also more knowledgeable as they get into industry. You realize that chemistry uh, will, besides going uh, giving us the doctors and pharmacists, which are in the medical sciences, it's quite uh, it's the required subject. Uh, the one that's compulsory if you want to do medical or related sciences. But it's also important in industry in general because some parts, so every topic, we usually refer to every topic brings out an, a, a person in industry who is doing a certain job. So when we are doing metals and extraction, we look at the blast furnace, that's a certain industry. If we are looking, let's say, for organic chem, we are looking at the extraction of petroleum, that's again a certain job in industry. So for every topic in the physical sciences, we'll find that there is someone who is actually doing a certain specific job. So, and not everyone has to become uh, all of them, but a person will become only one. But their basics must be in the right place, uh, especially at the IGCSE level, uh, it's the basics that are tested. But then once we get to, AS and A level, which is advanced, then there is a streamlining of certain specific uh, topics uh, becoming more and more advanced so that uh, it, it's only those that would need to pursue uh, a certain level of uh, chemistry who would need to proceed. Uh, but generally, we try by all means to prepare our students at the IGCSE level to be ready to do anything. And then when they do advanced, then they have to actually choose. And chemistry is not that subject uh, that anyone would actually do uh, if they are not uh, going to choose a subject that applies it. So it would be, it's more on the optional side. It's more uh, on the application side, uh, which is something that I always say then to my students, if you come to chemistry and someone sent you you are in the wrong place because you need to be able to learn it for yourself and we assist uh, with that. Uh, I could speak uh, for the whole day about Kim, but our time is a bit on the tight side. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Adam. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure if Tambi is able to come online, otherwise we'll move on to the general Q&A and there's quite a number of questions. May I ask uh, Mark, uh, Linda, to come online so we just quickly can run through those questions for the parents. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, yeah, there was quite a number of questions. I think it was quite a lovely um, audience that we had this evening. Um, there was questions regarding, uh, I think, logistics. So 
the stationary lists and the textbook lists when that will be published. I don't know, there's uh, some noise coming through, but if I maybe just answer the question, I think I have that in response. But the uh, stationary list, as well as the book list, uh, has been published already, so it is out. Uh, and we normally, it is available for parents if they need it, and we normally publish it on the website, and we normally put it under resources, uh, under the D6 and scanners. So that is available already, should parents require that. Perfect. Um, Mark, while you are there, maybe yourself and Mandy, and then we'll move on to Linda, is in terms of the pass rate and also un uh, career guidance support, which I know Mandy is involved with. Okay, the pass rate has been 100% uh, for the past few years. Uh, and that's not just matric, it's uh, throughout the school. So we just high school at the moment. So from grade eight to matric, it has been 100% passed. Uh, with regards to uh, career guidance. Yeah, Good evening, everybody. We host, um, we have an annual career day every year in which we invite various institutions to come out and speak to the children. We do give them um, access to face careers and go study to perform their own um, sort of form of um, psychometric evaluation. And that gives them a broad idea of where they'd like to go to. We then support them in applying to universities should they need our support and uh, providing testimonials, etc., based on their performance at school. Um, what is, if it is they need for school for varsity, we expose them not just to the academics, but also to other options. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mandy. And then uh, that same question just to us, Linda, and I'm not sure you're going to ask me to chip in as well. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, if I understand you correctly, Anne-Louise, um, the career options, the subject options, so we are intending to have a, a afternoon, early evening subject choice um, here at Eagle House for the Cambridge students or uh, future Cambridge students, um, where we will share our subject choice form with them and possible choices that they can make, possible careers that they can follow. And uh, you don't know it yet, but you will be invited to that. So thank you very much. Not a problem. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, uh, you've been a great help in the past, helping our students apply to universities. And there's been a lot of success stories, which I'm sure you're going to allude to now. So that helps a great lot for our students uh, to know that there's somebody helping them, guiding them, giving them very good advice. And some of our A-level students already writing at the moment have been accepted into universities. Um, I think just on that side, the subject advice is quite extensively supported um, for the Cambridge because of the nature. So the subject advice is as important as the career and guiding them through that from an early age. Now with the A-levels, because it's so focused, and that was another question that we might need to touch on, um, it's focused in a specific direction. So that is also supported with the university applications. Uh, we are a UCAS center, therefore we can do all the UK applications as a center for the students. And we provide extensive support, as Man Mandy mentioned, that uh, it's becoming more and more important that the school support testimonials and that the school supports their applications to the universities because they want to see those references and the resumes of the students. Um, something that is an offer for both IEB and um, for Cambridge is the President's Award, which is a bulk up on your resume and also your experiences. And Mark, maybe you can add on that where it assists you with the needed community hours as well in a more structured manner. So what we can do is we can share a little bit more detail on the President's Award as well, 
So yes, career is supported on all levels and the, the university assistance, and that's normally the tedious side for parents, is supported from the school. So if I, we can move on, Linda, uh, a parent has asked a question, what the difference would be between AS and A-level? You are mute. <laughs> Apology for that. Uh, AS level, as we said earlier, can be done over two years, which is basically your grade 11, grade 12 on a trick, but then you can carry on to A levels. If you do AS um, with those combinations I've explained earlier to get your matric with exemption, um, our national universities are geared to accept those students. If you do an A-level, it's actually a little step further, but A-level are mostly required by international universities. And, and I always tell this little story. We had an A-level student. Have a, um, he was studying three A-level subjects, physics, computer science, and maths. And he got two A's, and for maths, he got, got a B. And, and that was in examination, by the way, Cambridge has two cities, May, June, and then October, November, and that four of his maths, the London Universities was actually giving for him, and that's exactly where he is now studying. So A-levels will take it just that little bit further. It's a higher qualification. Nationally, I would think it's really close to a first-year varsity. And I think Mr. Moyer previously mentioned that um, first year students studying, coming through ASA levels, um, has a 100% pass rate in their first year varsity. I think because they can deal with the volumes of the syllabuses and also the application of what they've learned in the Cambridge uh, syllabuses. I hope that answers the question. Perfect. And I've just noted there that an AS qualification is exactly half of an A-level. It's a standalone and it's accepted in South Africa, New Zealand, America and some of the Canadian regions as well. Um, then just to quickly go over to what support structure is in place to support learners to excel in their studies. And there was a couple of questions with parental involvement and how we structure that. Um, Mark, I know that you've answered some of that, but if you can elaborate that online. Uh, I think we, we're big on the support. Uh, you know, as we're sitting here, we, we do have grade 12 learners that are with us till nine o'clock tonight, just to give them that extra boost. Uh, we have an extension of the day from half past two to half past three uh, every day for learners that do need support. So I know we also use uh, various applications like the CAT to see, uh, the CAT 4, to see where learners need support. So we do support learners uh, in areas where they, they do need extensive support. So with it being a small school, we find that, uh, and like I said earlier on, you know, there are many learners with uh, maybe, and we don't want to call them barriers, but there may be gaps in their knowledge, and especially with COVID, that created some of them. So these catch-up sessions are quite important. So we do have every day from Monday to Thursday, uh, and then if learners need extra as well, they then can arrange with the teachers. But, I think uh, parental like involvement. I mean, uh, parental involvement is important. You know, it's that triangle where learners will do as little as possible, uh, and if we're not on them, they will they will not until it becomes critical. So, learners, I, I mean, we need the parent support from home and for parents to, I mean, interact with the teachers as well, and teachers to interact with the parents so that we can have that uh, connection with the learner at home, just to make sure that, you know. Uh, they do do what they're supposed to do at home. So that unity is very important. Um, I think it's that, that triangle that we always talk about is critical for uh, success within the child. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. And I think um, something that's I important... I, uh, I don't know if my internet is unstable, but uh, do excuse that. Just to maybe also 
um, mentioned that there are interventions and that it is managed um, from your side. Um, for the Cambridge side, we do extensive assessments, so we are able to support the students on a diagnostic level, as you've mentioned. Um, and then obviously you do run some additional classes for the students, especially in mathematics, if I'm correct, Mark. That's correct, yes. Uh, not just mathematics, even though it does take a lot more, but uh, most of the subjects, especially the, the critical subjects or the subjects at risk, and those are normally with the higher applications, like your math, science, and accounting subjects, well, they do require a whole lot more. And I'm not sure if you want to add, and then we'll move on to those other questions. Yeah, maybe just quickly to say that, especially in sciences in maths, we do have extra classes, um, not extra lessons. For example, in maths, we have an extra period a week where students can bring their questions, specific questions that they have been struggling with in a specific theme. And uh, I mean, Arnold sitting next to me, yeah, he has taught on Saturday mornings uh, for students in the holidays, he invited them to come and attend specific theme lessons, where, um, especially after an exam where you see there's a theme that students are struggling with, then teaching extra classes on, on, on those topics so they can have their questions ready. And our students can ask online in chat in teams, ask their teachers, do examples, ask them to market for them. So yeah, I think we do that little bit of an extra mile just to assist our students. Perfect. And I, I think something that you've both mentioned is that um, access to the recordings and the online material just to revise and also just to clear up any doubts is important as a support. Yes, yes absolutely. Yeah. Um, some more logistic questions, what the dress code would be for the children. I know that we are phasing in a uniform, if you can maybe elaborate on that. And maybe Mark can go first. Uh, <laughs> the college is one step behind that. We're not so eager to do the uniform yet. But yeah, we are also looking with them um, at the a shirt, uh, a navy pants or a jean. Uh, but I think um, the IEB side is more precisely on what they want to, to wear in future. You know, as Linda said, it is a bit difficult calling it uniform. Uh, so we're referring it to, uh, to it as clothing options. You know, so we're busy phasing in a uniform. We haven't had a uniform for quite some time. Uh, but yes, we have uh, blue chinos or blue jeans. And then uh, we're waiting for the branded T-shirts. So. We haven't had a consensus with a t-shirt yet, but it will be a branded either white or powder blue uh, golf shirt or shirt. Um, and you know, the normal uh, no caps, uh, clothes, shoes, etc. So not very strict, but yes, some form of uh, formality. Perfect. Um, there was a question and a mark, I think. I think uh, you've uh, answered that as well in terms of how the IEB and the Cambridge on one campus is is operating. I think it's an important question and also the opportunities that it creates for the students if, if they do get that need to transfer or transition. There's specific areas that they cannot and can. Maybe just a very brief um, uh, discussion on that and then we'll move on. Uh, maybe ma'am linda can go first um yeah we have received students from cap schools and um we have recently received one from mark ieb um that moves over and ideally if they don't come over in grade eight coming here grade nine is not a problem because the grade nine and ten curriculum is one and they write the international exam for grade 9 and 10, the IGCSE, at the end of their grade tenure. We also had students coming from CAP schools um, in grade 11, where they only do the AS then with us. Um, and that means they must either take the full five, at least five subjects on AS level, because they do not have the extra subject on IGS as a backup. And we do advise them then to rather take six subjects. So if one slips through the grid, then you still have your five subjects that you can get a, a complete matric on that. 
But if they want to move further to A, A levels, they can also just take one IG subject with them. But uh, it's generally not a problem coming over, but if they come over at a specific time like grade nine, it's just better because we are trying to do 70% of the syllabus for IGs in grade nine and then 30% in grade 10 after which we start with revision. Perfect. Thanks. I think uh, you know, Linda's answered it. Uh, I think there's more focus on the Cambridge. I think the requirements are a little bit more strict. So uh, we're fully inclusive. And uh, I think it's easier to come from the Cambridge to IB and the learners will adapt quite easily. But like Pam Linda said, it's difficult at the later stage to jump from IB to, uh, to Cambridge. Uh, we do share one campus. Uh, we follow the same time slots, but different timetables. We share some teachers, but uh, mostly uh, teachers focus on their own uh, subject specialities. So it is one campus, but uh, you know, it is run differently, if I could answer that way. Perfect, thank you. Um, then another practical question, how many students we have on campus? And I think it's good to mention the amount of students that are in a class again. I know that you have made mention of that. Okay, the classes are, we try to keep it uh, physically less than 15. And we do have some learners that are online. Uh, our classrooms are small by design and it's for that reason because we don't want it to bulge too much. So classrooms will not exceed 16 at the most. Uh, and then some learners would be at home as well. So it is small classes. Uh, if we do need to start another grade, we'd rather start another grade in, instead of going to 20 or 22 learners. So currently we have two grade eight classes and two grade nine. Uh, there are 10 in each group. I mean, one grade 10, one grade 11, and one grade 12. That's on the IB. Okay, from, I from more, sorry. I was gonna just say, I'm sure it's smaller on your side, but you can take over, man. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, on our, our side, it's quite small. It varies from one to two A-level students in a class and uh, to maximum between 12 and 17, as I said, for subjects like maths, English, that everybody in that level must take. We have only one level, so we don't have two grade eight classes. We have really small classes. At the moment, the maximum is about nine. Um, in a class like grade nine, um, or grade 10, and also depending on the subject you're taking, not everybody takes chemistry, some have subject choices. During the hour, senior students prefer to be online, so they do come to campus once in a while, but not even every day. So that's why we are really focused on the online section, and um, as some of our students remain online. But the juniors, 8, 9, and 10, they generally prefer to come to campus uh, it's more of a socializing than something else so yeah we love to have them here and um our school i believe that interaction with the teachers thank you i can also really just important. add on to that with ib uh, from grade 10 to grade 12 where there are subject choices we also have maybe three or four learners in a class in a subject it's just for the common subjects um, english afrikaans and life orientation where the classes would be the full group Thanks, Anne-Louise. Okay, perfect. Um, then I'm going to just quickly ask Luzon to answer some um, or clarify some uh, questions regarding the admission procedure. And also that we do offer a bus service, just to elaborate on that as well for parents. And um, yeah, if you can take over on that. Thank you, Luzon. Thanks, Anne-Louise. Okay, so um, we do have a bus service. It works with pickup points. Um, so they go to a certain point and pick up all the students and drop them off there. Um, we, you, you would normally fill in a bus request form and we would give it to our bus coordinator. She will then look where is the nearest pickup point and communicate that with the parent but there is a bus for IUB and Cambridge. 
Um, and then how the application process works. It is um, basically what you would need is to go to the website, click on the applications button, and you need to fill in the application form. What I would need from you is uh, the latest school report you have, a character reference from the current school, parent consent to release student information, application fee is 750, that's just an admin fee, but that is for IEB and Cambridge. The only difference between the two is for Cambridge, we do an entrance assessment. So for both curriculums, there is a minimum admissions requirement. But for Cambridge, it is a little bit higher uh, that you need to meet. So therefore, we do the entrance assessment. We use it as a placement tool just to see if the student will be able to access the curriculum. But let's say you apply for Cambridge and we see the student would fit be a better fit for IEB, we would then suggest the IEB. I hope that answers the question. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I think it is good to put a face to the communication that will follow. Thank you, Lizanne. If we can quickly go back to Mark and Linda. Um, there has been a couple of questions in terms of um, the registration of the school and other provinces to have a the school. But that's that's um, I'm not sure, but we we are a fully registered school. Um, you can elaborate on that. Uh, maybe just a quick one from our side. Yes, we are actually part of Alma Mater, the group school. So uh, we form part of the registered Alma Mater, and that's where our students are writing their international examinations. Um, yeah, and we hope to become registered here on Eagle House in the near future which will be very nice to have our own exams uh, run here. Um, yeah, I think other than that, I was thinking of something else just now, but now I can't uh, but remember. If I do remember, I will tell you. Mark, I don't know and if you From our ahead. side, thanks. From our side, we are fully accredited, uh, registered with a GDE. We have a GDE number, which is known as an EMIS number. We fully registered with IEB and we also accredited by Uma Lucy. So we have full accreditation uh, you know, from the three main boards. I don't think that answers the question adequately. Perfect. I, I do believe so. Um, then just to uh, quickly ask that question, I know that we've answered that on the Q&A, the school times, but I think it is important for the other parents also to hear what the school times are. Um, yeah, we, we start at quarter to eight, so quarter past two, um, eight periods a day of 45 minutes. And we do have, at the moment, we do have French in the afternoon, and uh, two of our practicals are also scheduled in the afternoon, starting at 14.30. You know, our times are the same, except for the subjects. We also have a, comp uh, well, not compulsory, but at the end of the day, there is an hour uh, if learners do need uh, support, they can make an appointment, see the teachers, uh, very much like we explained earlier on. But the times are the same. I did put 7.30 in the uh, Q&A. We have a lineup at 7.30, a short assembly, and then classes start at quarter to eight. Perfect. Thank you for those. Uh, I know it's uh, logistical questions. Um, there was uh, one or two questions where they've uh, asked for what, how do we support engagement from the parents in the learning journey? I think maybe also just to um, discuss when parent evenings are facilitated and how that is facilitated and how the parents can get involved in terms of getting more um, regular feedback from management. Um, Mark, if I can go first, um, yes, uh, we love it when parents are involved and I really have an open door policy. Uh, we invite parents to meet with our teachers at the parents' meetings and we, as we are running three terms, at the end of every term we do write an internal examination and then early in the next term we have a parents' evening to discuss those reports and those marks and any concerns there may be. Uh, also the good news, of course, 
uh, we like that. That uh, parents are welcome to just make an appointment, walk into my office, and I'm sure Mark's exactly the same. So we do welcome parents showing an interest in their in their kids. It's lovely for children to see that the parents are joining in the parents' evening and have an interest in how they perform and how they achieve. Yeah, ours is exactly the same. Uh, we also uh, engage with parents and encourage parents. Uh, we do have compulsory parents' evenings. Uh, that's normally once a term after assessments. Um, and we do also have early warnings. So if we do notice anything, we will reach out to parents, but also open door policy. We also thrive on sharing good news. So we don't just like calling with bad news. If learners do well, we like to share that as well. Um, yeah, and we see, um, we function very well on WhatsApp groups, one for teachers, one for students and one for parents, so any relevant information gets shared with parents and you often get then um, interest from parents uh, from their side to uh, meet with us and we absolutely welcome that. Brilliant, Mark. I don't know if you want to add to that, otherwise um, I would like to just Ask one last question and then we'll round off the evening. We've uh, gone way over time, but it's always wonderful to have all these questions. Um, concessions and um, exams on support of these students, because I think that there was a consistent question on support for students that need a bit of extra help. And absolutely, concession is, uh, I mean, it goes by many other names, so concessions, uh, Accommodation. accommodations, and it's a tool that's not been used by. Uh, so many learners and I think it's also the stigma that's created around it but it's a tool that benefits them so we use like I said earlier on it's one of the affordances that's available to learners and we encourage them to use it it's not an automatic uh, they have to apply for these accommodations but it does support them so if we look at the most common uh, fear or whatever, it, it's exam stress. And some of them may not finish the exam in time. So they can apply for extra time uh, and they normally get between 10 and 15 minutes per hour. And that makes a huge difference uh, with the learners. I mean, it relaxes them. They know they've got some extra time and it just levels the playing fields. It's like golf, for example. Uh, all golfers are equal and they're made equal by the handicap. So I can go and play golf and I start with 40 points and I could beat someone that's been playing for 20 years. And many of our learners uh, are in the same boat. You know, we all learn differently. We, and some of them have different ways of learning. So these accommodations tend to level the playing fields. Uh, if learners have dysgraphia, for example, or dyslexia or dyscalculia, those are the things that, uh, Concessions can help. We can apply to the department and they could use a uh, electronic device like a computer to type their answers. And that would then be more readable and more legible. Uh, we find that learners with ugly handwriting are normally referred to as being stupid. Uh, and just because we can't read the handwriting but with the electronic device, it, it levels the playing field. So it's easy for teachers to mark their work and they can get maximum but sometimes learners have to shy, parents feel embarrassed, and they don't apply for these things. And when it gets to matric exam, then the learners suffer. So we, we open that to learners as soon as they possibly can. So concessions and that kind of support is, is huge for what we do because our learners have been suffering for far too many years, and we've been accepting it and hiding behind the stigma of, uh, you know, our children are stupid. They just learn differently. That's the only difference. Um, I don't know if Mandy wants to add anything mm. or if there's any, if that answers the question. I think I it answers it clearly. And then uh, obviously those intervention assistance that is provided to the student. Linda, I don't know if you want to add, I know Cambridge um, basically calls it access arrangement, which is a little bit different. To the other yeah, and uh, it's just, yeah, it's just uh, going that formal route, getting that, um, I don't know what they call it, a certificate or an acknowledgement that they have that. And then Cambridge do allow extra time for that. We also do it from time to time in internal exams. If we see that a student, a student battles a little bit or is very anxious, 
we would allow that, that Cambridge would uh, require that formal route if they want to write in the international exam. Perfect. Thank you. I think um, I'm not going to keep our parents any longer. We've, we've been on here for quite some time. I really do hope that our parents have enjoyed it. We will be sharing a, a link. I know that some of the parents have been dropping on and off. So if you want to review that on YouTube, and it will be also emailed automatically to you after the session. Um, I'm going to ask Linda and Mark just to end off the session, and then um, we can all enjoy our evening. Linda? Um, they're welcome to pop in um, at Eagle House, come visit us. Uh, we do allow students to visit us for a day or so to see how it is. So they're absolutely welcome to do that. Um, yes, thank you very much for the evening. From our side as well, thank you, Anne Louise. Thanks for arranging it. Thanks to all the teachers for availing themselves, but most importantly, thank you to our parents. Uh, and the learners, you know, for your interest in our school uh, and your incapable hands with uh, moves on. So please give it a call, make arrangements to come and visit us. Uh, at the end of the day, the learners come and they feel uh, what the school is like. And, you know, ultimately they must have a say in the matter as well. So we do encourage our learners to come and spend the day and just get the feel for the school. But thank you very much. It was a very fruitful evening. Thank you so much. I'm ending off the session. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Same to you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.